if I came to you as a doctor and said, I have this drug that can improve your immune system, it'll improve bone health, it'll improve your cardiovascular system, it will increase longevity. You'd be like, this is a sham. This, there's no way there's no such a thing. And I say, yeah, it, it's called exercise. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, and today we're gonna meet with Eric Degatti. He's a personal trainer that has, well, worked with professional athletic teams, professional athletes, and even people like you and I that could use a little guidance. He also teaches personal trainers. He's the guy they go to. He's the guy that they learn from. And I'm excited to have him on the show because we talk about so many things for good health. And we probably touched on exercise a bit, but today we get to dive in deep. Eric, thank you for being on the show. How are you this fine day? Absolutely. Thank you for, for having me. Thanks for the opportunity. So you're in New Jersey, yes? I am. You I'm, can tell I'm, by my sexy New Jersey accent. <laughs> Actually, you got this deep, majestic voice. I love it. It's one of those, here I am behind the microphone all the time. But I don't have that majestic sound that you that's coming across. So it's awesome. Powerful. I guess that goes with the whole athletic trainer thing. I don't know. Just making stuff it's up. A, it's, a, it's a lot of a lot of years of coaching and having to 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 command the room of, of 40, 50, 60 athletes. Ah, yes. Authority. There's some authority in it. That's what it is. Do you drink coffee? Did you start the day with coffee or is that a no-no? It's not that it's a no-no. I just don't like the taste of it. I, I love the idea of it. I wish I liked it. It's just the taste just doesn't, it's it just, I always say it, it kind of tastes like uh, hot water over potting soil. It just, it I can't acquire the taste. The energy in a cup sounds fantastic, but it just doesn't, doesn't work for me. I'm, a, I'm actually a big tea drinker. Oh, okay. I just made my wife a cup of green tea with a little coconut oil to give it a, I guess that's the median chain triglycerides thing going drop it to a stevia that's how she likes it so i, I can appreciate tea. i started with mm. coffee I, it's just one of those things i do but anyway how about nutrition in general is that a big part of your life so i need to know enough about it that's one of those areas where it, i need to be a mile wide as much as a mile deep and so i need to know enough about it to know if is that your primary issue is that the big rock that we need to to encounter first and if it is then we have some basic fundamentals that we need to get you and most of what i found and even talking with some of the top nutrition experts in the world is most of it is about habit forming so if i can get you at least in in to developing good habits then that's usually 80 percent of the way to your victory if it needs more than that, well, then I have to refer out to somebody, and that's where I have a network of people. But it's certainly a huge tenant of what we do, and we we have to appreciate that, and we have to understand where is the weak link, and that's kind of the approach to really everything is to say, okay, you, you, you are where you are now, and then there's this place that you'd like to be, what's in the way? And so we have to clear the way of any obstacles, and sometimes nutrition is a really big one. Yeah, for my audience, a lot of them have gone through some health challenges and their diet might not be optimal for uh, being in the gym. It might not be the gold medalist in the powerlifting diet, but it might be a very cleansing, detoxifying diet so that they can strengthen their immune system against some horrible condition or disease. Or it might be a gut healing diet because they have an inflammatory bowel condition. So it might be very probiotic and, and gut healing, things like bone stock soup, to heal the gut. Uh, a lot of people come to me for aloe vera to help heal their bowels and strengthen their immune system. What does a diet look like for someone that wants to reach peak performance in the gym? So first of all, understand that these athletes are also people that 
get sick. There are also people that have life stresses and have all these other things that, that your audience is listening to. So they have to address all those things as well. The only difference is, the primary difference, I should say, is their margin of error. And what I mean by that, when I'm talking to people about habit forming with, with nutrition, I usually say, look, if we can follow the 80-20 rule, meaning if you follow all the, the, the guidelines that we're going to give you 80% of the time, the other 20%, you can kind of have your vices, whatever that is. And that's a makes it a much more livable and easier way to have higher compliance. And you'll get to where you need to get to in just no particular rush. Now, if I have an athlete that has a season or a big meet or a big uh, tryout or something coming up, well, that 80-20 turns into 90-10 or maybe even 100% on. But even for them, that's only for a short period of time. They are human beings too. And so they, they pizza doesn't s- stop tasting good once you put on a jersey or a helmet or a, uh, a grab a ball. So those sorts of things we have to, to manage as well. So it's just a matter of it, the time frames and working around very specific time constraints because they're not going to move back that fight or that soccer match or that just because you're not ready. So that's the biggest difference is they have much more strict because their their careers are on the line. Right. Yeah. Pizza never stops tasting good. So I can agree with that. It's it's breakfast, lunch, dinner. It could be. It still tastes good anytime. You can wake up in the middle of the night and eat it cold out of the refrigerator. It still tastes good. Well, uh, I'm from New Jersey. I could turn a rock. I could turn in any direction, throw a rock and hit one of the greatest pizza places you've ever tried. So, <laughs> and, and I love that. We don't have that here in Florida, but I like to liken aloe vera because we have competitors to pizza in the sense that even when it's bad, it's still pretty good. (laughs) There's really good pizza. We have pizza in Florida. It's not New Jersey or New York pizza, but it's still pizza. It's all right. It's all right. Not the healthiest choice. And I I like the, what you said that you can have your vices, the 80, 20, you're just not going to get there as fast. And for the audience, that's limited room for error, you might be in that 100% category right now. There is no room for the recreational foods, so to speak. And and I get that. And for others, maybe it's that, okay, you're still headed in the right direction. You're doing the 80-20 thing, but not getting there as fast as you can. So I like the way you put that. Absolutely. So I need programs that people can follow. I'm not selling your 30 day challenges or your six weeks to summer type programs. I'm training people for a lifetime. Yeah. What's, what's your longest standing client? How many years? Uh, I have some clients that I've had for 20 years. Okay. No. Yeah. So they, are we they, still looking uh, at the 20 year co- client? Are we still saying, okay, where do we go from here? Are we still making gains and improvements? Are we maintaining? What do you do after 20 years? The way life comes at you is that directions change. And what is it that you want to focus on? And maybe it's discovering new things where I have a guy who's in his sixties who plays super competitive tennis half the year and then skis half the year. Then I have another guy who's super big into fast pitch softball, but also then plays pickleball and does some other things. And I have a woman who's a black belt in Taekwondo and they're all in their sixties. And so that dynamic changes depending on what it is that they want to attack life with. I'm not getting the person that comes to a trainer because they need somebody to get them to work out, right? That I'm not your guy. I'm the person that that they go to that says, I'm already going to work out. I'm doing this. I just need the direction to get to specifically where I want to go. And I need somebody who understands what my challenges are, whether it's my my aches and pains that generally come with getting up over 40 and how do you handle those or the life stressors and how do I manage all those different things and talking about how do I uh, avoid overtraining? How do I make sure that I'm doing the right things? How do I make the right choices? That's really the person that I'm working with. Yeah, I, I like the way you put that because everyone has different goals and different priorities and the personal trainer might be for the... 90 year old that just wants to be able to put on his own clothes again and get dressed and well, okay, we got to get you moving again and get you back in shape so that you can dress yourself or so that you can accomplish the things that you want to again. Yeah, we do a really poor job of defining what exercise is. It's in a lot of ways. In one, it's always been much more of a vanity thing. And people are now finally coming around to understand that there's so much more to that 
that if I came to you as a doctor and said, I have this drug that can improve your immune system, it'll improve bone health, it'll improve your cardiovascular system, it will increase longevity. You'd be like, this is a sham. This, there's no way there's no such a thing. And I say, yeah, it, it's called exercise. And yeah. <laughs> it's incredibly powerful, but it's it's not easy. And so, in, so with that, people, and we also do a really poor job of selling people exercise. And what I mean by that is that we intimidate people with exercise. We make people think, well, you have to go to this special gym and you have to have a membership and you have to do it for an hour every day. And, and that's not the case. You could go and do 10 minute little exercise snacks throughout your day. You, you don't have to join a gym. You can get a lot done just at home with your own body weight. There's a lot of different things that could quantify as exercise that people don't really make the connection of that. If you like to dance, if you like to ride your bike, you like to do cross country skiing. All those things count. You don't have to be looking at flashing lights on a special machine that tells you how many calories you burned for it to count as exercise. Yeah, I like that. Everyone has everything they need. Their own body weight is a great place to start. I like that. But since we're talking about equipment, if you were to go get a gym membership and you're looking for a place around you, what would you look for in a gym? What kind of equipment? What kind of people there? Um, it depends on who I am. Now, if it's me, I, I just, I need more of an environment and I need really, uh, for my own training, I need more space. Space is a commodity in most gyms because most gyms are not truly a training center. What they really are is an equipment rental, right? You get to go and use their equipment for hours, as much as you like every day. Because, and then they, so if we're selling you an equipment rental, we're just going to cover every square inch of the place with just equipment. And we're going to have a piece of equipment that works this body part and this body part and this special. And that's not what I would be looking for, but I know what I'm doing when I go into a gym. Um, and so what I'm looking for may be different for the next person. Now, if, if you're a beginner, you need to look at a few things. You need to look at, it, at the culture and the welcoming culture that's there. So you need to feel, feel welcome. And unfortunately, a lot of gyms, because it's this culture that does not accept people who don't look like the vanity driven norm that we think of with, with gym culture is they don't feel comfortable there. And you need to go to a place where people look like you feel like you and make you feel comfortable. So that's number one. And there are a lot of incredible facilities that do that. And there's a great community within there. And then also a place that has some quality instruction that can give you some guidance that tells you what to do. And that doesn't mean you need to hire a trainer three days a week. It means you need to have a place that can tell you, hey, that class is probably not the right one for you. Well, why don't you try this one? Or, hey, why don't you start with these machines first? And then once you get good at that, come and see me and I can show you some new stuff to do. It doesn't have to be this commitment that people are scared of. And it just gives you some guidance so you're getting off on the right foot. Because if not, unfortunately, there's a high amount of people who go to a gym and they actually get hurt which is completely 180 degrees out of phase of why we're even going there. We're going there to get healthier and then you end up getting hurt trying to get healthy. It's kind of this weird dichotomy we have at the gym. But when you take someone who's been sitting in a desk and chair all day and for sometimes years at a time, and you ask them to start moving in positions and shapes and postures and planes of movement that they're not used to, well, there's going to be some risk involved because exercise is a stress and we want to make sure that we do it right. And so it's worth the investment up front to get a trainer or coach who can kind of show you those things so you at least get off on the right start. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. You can go in there and think you know what you're doing and be doing something that's actually making things worse. What are some of the things that you've seen in the gym where people were actually doing more harm than good? Maybe a technique that they were doing improperly or possibly even someone telling them to do it a certain way that was wrong? Well, I think it's more on the, on the macro level of the programming is that uh, a lot of what the, the gym culture is, is this bias towards bodybuilding. The, the good news is a lot of what we owe to having big fitness centers all over the place goes back to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And it goes back to when he came to America and made bodybuilding big and then gyms became big. And you started seeing first, it was just a, a male dominated thing going to gyms. And then women started to creep in a little bit. And then the age barriers around that started to spread out where it wasn't just your 20 and 30 year olds and you're getting younger and older people showing up. And now you have what we see here, but a lot of it is still biased in those early bodybuilding roots. Now, if you're a bodybuilder, that's awesome. 
if you're not a bodybuilder, which is 98% of the rest of the world, you don't need to go in and train your chest and triceps on one day and your back and biceps, because that's not how your body naturally works in real life. And it's also much more taxing on your body. Bodybuilders train five, six days a week. They eat an enormous amount of calories. They have a very strenuous type of stressful training schedule that for the average person who's a workout two, three days a week doesn't need that. But the biggest mistake I see is trying to emulate the workouts of bodybuilders. Okay. And that's not saying bodybuilding is bad. It's just saying the average person who just needs to get off the couch and start moving should not train like a bodybuilder. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. Yeah, I like that you brought up Arnold, and I remember reading one of his books many, many years ago and learning from it, but it was geared towards bodybuilding. And the specific thing that I recall is he said, if you want to have big arms, you have to have a big chest. But if you want to have a big chest, you have to have big legs. And I remember thinking, well, that doesn't make much sense to me. But then I went to school and I learned, oh, okay, when you put more stress on your body, it affects the hormones of your whole body and they go everywhere. So the it's not the arm and chest connected because you're doing bench press and you're working in both, but it's a larger muscle group here, which puts more stress on the body, which drives hormones more than just working on your little biceps. But if you really want to stress your body, you would work on the larger muscle group in the legs, the, the, the quads, the hamstrings, uh, your calf muscles, all the big meaty muscles. But that again was geared towards driving hormones for the whole body for the sake of uh, becoming like Arnold. <laughs> and who, who didn't want to look like him? And you know, you're not going to look like him by accident. And that's another thing people have said. They say, oh, I don't want to put on too much muscle. And I say, look, I've been spending my entire life trying to put on too much muscle. I wish it was that easy. Um, so that's not going to happen. But if you look at something as simple as, as doing a squat and what that involves, that if you could take a, a light dumbbell or kettlebell and hold it in front of you and do, so I'm not talking about people think squats, they automatically think this big bar in your back, but that's bending over your back and you're, there's chalk and spit and blood and like this, this type of scene, that's what they think a squat is. Well, you could take a light kettlebell or dumbbell, hold it in front of you and do a squat and you will have trained basically everything from head to toe if you can do it properly in terms of movement. And you don't need to go in and spend five minutes isolating your abdominals and five minutes isolating your, your biceps and five minutes isolating this uh, leg muscle and that leg muscle. You've, you've kind of covered it all for the most part. Are you going to cover it enough to go on stage in your underwear in a bodybuilding show? No, but you're going to cover it plenty that you're going to feel, look, and, and perform a whole lot better throughout your day. Yeah, it's neat. The kettlebell is a great tool. You can do so much with it and it doesn't take up a lot of space. When I think of exercise, I think of not just strength training, that's maybe one part of exercise, but there's also agility and there's flexibility and there's endurance training. And the kettlebell can be used for literally all of those areas. It's a wonderful tool. That's kind of where I also think people need to think uh, more in terms of uh, what do I want to accomplish? You might be in your 60s or 70s and really need more gains in the flexibility or maybe more in the endurance and the cardiovascular. You lose your breath when you walk up a flight of stairs. Um, we need to think in terms of, okay, where am I? Where do I want to be? What's it going to take to get there? 
And then in terms of aging, the, one of the biggest links now is the power of exercise and longevity. And there's some really powerful tools that you can look at that are actual really accurate tests of mortality risk. And two of them correlate directly with exercise. One is your what's called your VO2 max, which is your ability to uptake oxygen when you're doing an aerobic activity. And that is scored. You can go to an exercise lab and have that done where that is scored. And they know that if you get below a certain score, that you can't live without assistance, right? And then everything above that puts you further and further away from that type of living. And then also, believe it or not, your grip strength. You can test your grip strength and your grip strength has a high correlation with your um, mortality risk. And that's not because of how strong your hands are it, or your arm. It's really because that is a gateway into your vitality and how in those, the people who have a stronger grip are the people who fall less. They're the people who have stronger bones, who can withstand coming out of a fall, even if they did fall. So those are some of the biggest things that we look at with exercise when it ties to longevity. Oh, okay, very neat. I like that. I just connected that just now when you talked about it. And I'm as I'm thinking in my mind, you're right. That makes sense. It's vitality, the grip strength, and a very feeble. You're probably going to also have poor balance and coordination. And it makes sense. I never thought of that. What a good measurement. Easy to do. What are people doing wrong that's causing them to get injured? Um, one is that they have to understand that they have to first, I always say there's kind of three steps to how we move. We got to first move, uh, well, now what does move well mean is means your body does not get in its own way. Meaning you should be able to keep your legs straight with your feet together and touch your toes. You should be able to reach your hands up overhead so your arms can get in line with your ears and you should be able to reach back and kind of do a slight back bend. You should be able to reach behind you and touch your shoulder blade from either the top or the bottom. You should be able to rotate freely about 90 degrees from right to left. If you can't do those things, well, then what, when you go in and start doing exercise, whether it's formal exercise in a gym or you're going out and you're going to go play tennis or you're going to go play golf, and then you're trying to rotate away more than 90 degrees and you can't even do that without a club in your hand, well, then that's a recipe for exercise. You're going to get that range of motion from somewhere, and it's usually places that we don't want it, whether it's your low back, whether it's your hip, whether it's your knee, your neck, your shoulder, places that you don't have it, and it's going to put additional stress across your body. So the first thing is we need to move well and, and move well enough that you're not encumbered by your own movement. If you can't do those things, then there are very simple things that you could do to address those things so you can do those. So that's, that's number one. And then from there, you need to move with purpose. A lot of times when people go into exercise and they say, okay, I'm going to do this exercise and I have to do a set of 10 repetitions, they just kind of go through and move it from point A to point B. And just so they could check the box and say, I did the exercise where your movement should be purposeful. You should understand why you're doing it, what you're trying to accomplish, what it should feel like to do right. And you should know what it's going to look like if you do it wrong. And so if you don't understand those parameters and you're just kind of checking the box, we don't know if that's going to provide the result that you're hoping for. Yeah. One of the things I like in a gym is a mirror for that reason. So you can actually kind of gauge what you're doing. It's not a vanity thing where you love to look at yourself in the mirror, but you're actually getting some feedback about your body position. I would imagine you get a lot more from a coach, a personal trainer that's there with you to help straighten things up. Do you do that virtually as well? Yes. I have a, an entire virtual program that I do that through. And so with that, I have everything set up where I've recorded all my exercises on video and I'm walking you through the entire process to say, okay, here's how you're going to set up. This is the movement from here to here. This is what you should feel. Make sure you don't do this. Pay attention to this. Maintain this throughout the exercise. And so it's become something that allows me to be able to have a larger reach to where I can only work with people who could travel to me locally, uh, especially because of some of the athletes that I work with, where I have a pro football player who's leaving for Europe. I have people who are all over the country that I need to work with. And so that is a huge help from the technological side for me to be able to deliver that. All right. Uh, I think that's pretty cool too. So is it like Zoom based too, or just videos that they're watching or... How does that work? For myself personally, some coaches will do a, a Zoom or FaceTime type of session. As I said earlier, the people that I'm working with primarily are looking just more for direction and coaching. So I do coaching sessions with them virtually. And then from there, they have 
the the programs are all done on video and they can even video themselves and send that to me for review as well oh okay i videotape myself send it to my coach that'd be interesting that would work when i wake up in the morning the first thing i like to do is stretch my spine and I think that's probably the best first exercise for everyone because the central nervous system comes out through the bones in the back with the nerves going to every single muscle group. I believe exercise should start first before anything after every period of inactivity. I like that you mentioned exercise snacks. Is there a best time of the day to exercise and go into like a gym routine or a push-up routine or whatever set of exercises you're going to do? Do you find morning or evening or? There's ideal and then there's best. What's best is whenever you're going to do it, right? Whatever is going to work with your schedule. If I have a, a busy mom with three kids who's got to get lunches made and get them on buses and get them off to school, telling her she needs to have this specific biohacker morning routine where it's going to, she needs to get morning sunlight and she, she needs to meditate and she needs to, to journal and she needs to do deep breathing. It's like, she doesn't have that time. So it has to work within your schedule and within your lifestyle. Now, that being said, in the morning, it's going to kind of set the table for the rest of the day. You started off with that win and it's going to create more energy, more focus, everything throughout the rest of the day. So if you can do it in the morning, that would be ideal, but not at the expense of sleep because that's just as important because that's where we make all our gains from exercise. So it's kind of a fine balance in finding someone's particular lifestyle, their schedule, and what they're going to be most compliant with. But if I had the ideal, then yes, I would do it first thing in the morning. Yeah. I also like to look at traits that make people successful in business, but also in other areas. In business, there are certain traits that people have. And you look at a successful person, a big business owner, and they do these things. They all do this, these same things or have these same traits. What are some of the traits that we see that makes su someone successful in the gym and when it comes to their overall fitness and health. For, for the listening audience, what traits would they want to incorporate in their life to be successful when it comes to physical fitness? I would say the first thing I tell people is you need to establish non-negotiable habits, right? And what that means is you have to establish whatever it's going to be, that that is going to happen come rain or shine. And that is because it's definitive of who you are. And a lot of this comes down to our makeup and kind of how we see ourselves. And so if we have someone that uh, says, well, I'm not a gym person. Well, you have to kind of redefine that then. Or if you're someone who previously had issues with anything, whether it was food, whether it was alcohol, whether it was anything, so you have to, to remove that person from your life and you have to become this new person. And so because because of that, you have to reinforce that every day with non-negotiable habits. And there's an expression I use a lot with my clients, and it's you get what you tolerate. And basically that the people who are really high performers won't tolerate themselves giving up on themselves, won't tolerate that old person coming in and getting them or uh, tolerate that if this is part of my daily routine, this is my non-negotiable, whether it's meditation, whether it's their run in the morning, whether it's their daily breathing routine, whether it's they do 100 push-ups, whatever it is, that's going to happen. And they're going to find a way for it to happen. If they're on the road, they'll do it in their room or at the gym in the hotel. They're going to figure out a way because they're not going to let themselves down. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of us do when we fail at exercise. I'm Dr. Haley, and oddly, the supplement that changed my health the most was not aloe vera. It was powdered fruits and vegetables, but it did not come in capsules. I used to take a brand that came in capsules and I did not notice a difference. But when I tried a brand where the serving size was a scoop equal to more than 40 capsules, I could feel a difference. That's where Aya Green's powdered vegetables and fruits comes in. And to make it easier for you this month, April of 2024, you can use the coupon code IAGREE, one word, I-A-G-R-E-E, -E, without any spaces, to get 20% off a single can purchase. Normally you'd have to buy a bundle of three to save 20%, but I'm convinced you will notice the difference. You will notice the benefit and come back for more. There's a good chance you'll also find a free shipping option. So head to HaleyNutrition.com now and use the promo code IAGREE for 20% off IAGREEN's single can throughout April, 2024. Now back to the show. 
And I'm thinking out loud when you talk about non-negotiable habits, I love that phrase. I might even be the title of this discussion. That non-negotiable habit might be a minute to start. <laughs> I'm going to wake up and I'm going to spend 100%. a minute stretching. And after a few days, it might be five minutes. And you can always start small with the non-negotiable habits and build on them. I like that. Don't try to do them all at once. In everybody, the most famous four words in, in my world is it all starts Monday, right? Is that people are going to say Monday morning, I'm going to lace them up. I'm going to watch Rocky. I'm going to go for a five mile run. I'm going to do everything. And it's just overkill. You don't need to do that. And you need to start incrementally and then layer your habits to your point to say, okay, I'm going to start with the two minute deep breathing routine that I'm going to do. And then on top of that, now I'm going to add some mobility to that deep breathing. So two minutes becomes five minutes. And then when I'm done with that, I'm going to try to do as many pushups as I can. And then maybe that five pushups turns into six. And then, so then you're seeing some success and su success kind of begets success. And so that's really what we want to have. If you do it the other way around and you say, I'm going to go out and run five miles and then you wake up the next morning and you need a half a bottle of Advil to get through the day, you're not successful. And so I always say you need to be two things to be successful with exercise. You need to be challenged because that's what changes us. If you're not challenged, you're not going to change. Your body has no reason to change. But if you start lifting heavy things, your body goes, oh my gosh, I better get stronger. I better build some muscle. If you start challenging your cardiovascular system, it says I need to get a little more fit and a little more efficient. And so with that, you need to be challenged, but you also need to be successful. You need to be successful in that you want to come back and do it again the next day. And it doesn't mean you wake up every morning dying to exercise. It just means that you're not breaking yourself down and beating yourself up because that's not the route. And unfortunately, the whole no pain, no gain thing has steered more people away from exercise than the opposite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been definitely misused. I also think of non-negotiable habits as taking time off also, meaning if you go to the gym every day, seven days a week, that might lead to burnout. Maybe a non-negotiable habit would be to take one day a week off. Yeah, so there's there's three main tenets that I teach people that kind of go through. Move, which we already talked about in terms of you gotta have some level of movement, whatever that is for your goal. Then you need to fuel, and fuel is, as we talked about a little bit, with nutrition is the obvious, but fuel is also everything you let in your eyes and ears, okay? And that's the people you hang around with, the TV you watch, the social media that you follow, all those sorts of things. What you give your attention to is going to have an effect on you as well. And then the last piece of that is reset, is that we don't make our gains in the gym. And we make our gains the other 23 hours of the day. And I always give the explanation early on when we first meet to explain the, the kind of analogy of seeds and soil is to say, when we train, we're not actually building you up. You're actually challenging yourself and your body's now, as soon as that's over saying, oh my gosh, I'm if you're going to keep doing that, I'm going to have to adjust. I'm going to have to adapt because that's what we do. If it was hot, we'd sweat. If it's cold, we'd shiver. And so if you challenge yourself, it's going to try to adapt to those stressors. And so that means that magic is not happening in the walls of the gym. It's happening those other 23 hours a day. And what fuels that, that resetting is your nutrition, is your sleep, is your rest, is your lifestyle. All those sorts of things is what, what is actually feeds it. So if you just go and train yourself all the way to exhaustion every single day and you never give yourself the chance to reset, it's like planting seeds on cement. It's never going to grow. You need to give yourself fertile soil. And so that's where we have some pretty complex systems we can actually use to measure and gauge your, your recovery to make sure that we're always right at that edge of your ability where you're challenged and successful at the same time. I like it. So how does someone get in touch with you if they want to call you and say, Eric, can you help me? What's the best way? The easiest way is to reach out to me just through my website. I have everything kind of all in the hub there. It's just my name. It's E-R-I-C-D-A-G-A-T-I.com. And uh, I even have on the homepage, I have something called Ask Eric because I do a lot of these public type of appearances and people have questions and they'll want to ask about certain things. So they can ask me a question. It goes to my email and then we can start the dialogue that way. Plus you have links to all my different programs and offerings and my social media and those sorts of things are all on there as well. Okay, great. And when someone does hire you, what does a first beating look like? Is that where you're just digging in and finding out what they want to accomplish or what? 
What do you do? Yes, there's a bunch of different assessments that we'll do first on the global level to kind of see where you're at in terms of your goals, in terms of where you're at, in terms of your lifestyle and your focus and trying to start to find where are those weak links? What are those big rocks in the way of holding you back? What are those obstacles? And then from there, we can get a little bit more specific where we can evaluate your movement and those sorts of things as we get further into the journey. And then from there, your program just adapts to those things. So if you're someone who can't touch your toes, well, something like a deadlift where you're going to have to lift the bar from the ground doesn't seem like a really good idea. So that's going to have to come out of your program. And it's not because those are bad or those are dangerous. It's just because they're not right for you right now. And we're going to give you some things to help you touch your toes. So eventually you can do those things. And so that's kind of where the process evolves from is, is kind of seeing where you're at now, where do you want to go? And what are those big rocks that are in the way? I don't want to contradict you, but... <laughs> for me, deadlifts were the right thing. <laughs> this is this is a funny thing. It was back probably, I don't know, 30 years ago. And I remember moving one of those, those pull-out couches with the big metal frame kind of turns into a bed oh, type yeah. thing. I remember I was on the second story of my apartment moving out, and somehow I had to move that thing by myself and walk down a winded stairs. And getting that thing over my head... I remember yanking it off the ground all at once, thinking I'm going to need some momentum. And when I got it on my head, I thought, that is not good. Something very bad just happened. But it's on my head, so I'm going to go around the stairs and get it down. And then I had to figure out how to get it up on the back of my pickup truck. And I thought maybe kind of like a little running jump type thing, and then I'll slam it down. Finally got it down and couldn't move for a long time. Could not, not touch my feet, couldn't touch my knees. And after about oh, seven or eight months of stepping forward with my left foot and then dragging my right up to meet the other one, I decided to go back to the gym and do deadlifts and squats. And they look like um, I had to get the bar up on the rack and, and, and pick it up. And I couldn't even bring the bar down to my knees on the deadlift. And the squat was more like a knee bend. But within two weeks, it went further and further and further. And of course, after warming them up and stretching and stretching and stretching, after about eight months in two weeks, literally completely healed. And I had to, whatever it was, I had to exercise and stretch the injury. And I, I say that not to say those things are right or wrong for anyone, but for anyone listening that doesn't think they can, maybe it's exactly what you do need. It could be that thing that brings you back to who you were, that maybe you lost, maybe there was an injury, maybe you just let it go, but there is hope and you can be healthier and better off tomorrow than you are today. And when you do that, you're essentially reversing the aging process. You're extending your life by making wise choices. Eric, I want to thank you for your expertise. I want to encourage people that need that help to follow the links. I'll have links to your website and to your YouTube channel. You have a lot of great content on YouTube. Any closing thoughts? Well, it's funny you mentioned that, that analogy and that story, and that's, that's awesome that you're able to do that. And one of the things I tell people, because as you mentioned earlier, I train trainers. And I say, look, we have an obligation to give people a certain freedom. And what that freedom is, is that freedom that if you have to move a couch, you should be able to move a couch. And so that's what we're training for is real life. And so I say all the time to my trainers that I'm coaching is that if you train somebody regularly and they can't come and help me move a couch, well, then your program needs to get looked at with a pretty, with some scrutiny because there's a problem there. And so we're training in the gym, not to get good at being in the gym. We're training so we can get good, that we have the freedom that we can do whatever we like to do. So if we want to pick up our grandkids, if we want to go play tennis, if we want to go for a hike or a bike ride, we shouldn't have the fear that we're going to break down or get hurt or, or that we're just too fragile to do that. And so that's what a good program does is it gives you that freedom that you can go out and live life. Yeah. Even into your later years, you should be able to not only do the things you want to do in life, but you should be able to have fun doing them. You should be able to participate in sports. You're what, I think I heard you say in another podcast that you're in your fifties. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm in my late fifties. You know, I still play pickleball, skateboard and do all of these things. And I think you said you're playing baseball. 
like 35 and older men's men's hardball baseball yeah and i set out with the intention that i'm not going to be the guy that with the knee sleeve or the 10 wraps on his body or needs to grease up and bend gay just to be able to get out in the field and i'm not going to get a pinch runner and i'm not going to do any of that stuff that i'm still diving for balls i'm still legging out triples i'm still doing everything that i want to do i get to be a kid every sunday morning and so that's the freedom that my training gives me now and before we close how many people do you know in their 70s and maybe even 80s that are still playing sports? I just mentioned some of the clients that I have there that are in their, their late 60s and still doing high level stuff and they have no intention on slowing down anytime soon. Yeah, I, I, Tom Brady was my hero playing football into mid 40s. I thought, wow, at a professional level, Certainly, we should be able to, on a fun level, continue to do these things for more, many more years. So, Eric, I enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you for sharing your expertise. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on The Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel, where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com, and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.